Welcome. Thanks for viewing our weekly sermon. I'm Pastor Malone, and we pray that this message be a blessing to you and help you grow closer to Jesus. If you'd like to know more about having a personal relationship with Jesus or to connect with us as a church, please visit westacres.org. Thanks again, and God bless. We all plan. It's human nature. We set a path, carefully walking the line to bring order to the chaos around us. But life, so it seems, never quite agrees with this path. We endure blow after blow of mistakes and missteps, disaster and defeat. Set ablaze, our plans char and fracture, destroyed. But what of God's plan? No. God's plan cannot be upended, for it was laid in eternity's past, before the foundations of the earth. For we are but a breath, a passing shadow. But God is eternal, everlasting, as is his faithfulness to his people. Though our eyes may be darkened from suffering, the sun still rises. For we must always look beyond ourselves to behold the faithful hand of God. copy of God's Word and turn with me to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 41. We're going to be continuing our uh, series on Joseph. If you're just uh, joining us in, uh, don't worry. I'm not going to uh, keep you in the dark on, on a lot of things. Um, but once you've found your place, uh, please stand with me as we show respect and reverence uh, to the reading of God's Word. Genesis chapter 41, verses 1 through 36. Joseph is still in prison. This is where we pick up. It says, After two whole years, the Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. And behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump, and they fed in the reed grass. And behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly, thin cows ate up the seven attractive, plump cows. And Pharaoh awoke, and he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump, full ears. And Pharaoh awoke. And behold, it was a dream. So in the morning his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, I remember my offenses today. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me and the chief baker in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, uh, we dreamed on the same night, he and I, each having a dream with its own interpretation. A young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. When he told him, uh, he interpreted our dreams to us, giving an interpretation to each man according to his dream. And he interpreted to us, so it came about. I was restored to my office, and the baker was hanged. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself, changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream. There is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Then Je Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream I was standing on the banks of the Nile. Seven cows, plump and attractive, came up out of the Nile and fed in the reed grass. Seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and thin, such as I had never seen in all the land of Egypt. And the thin, ugly cows ate up the first seven plump cows, but when they had eaten them, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were still as ugly as the beginning. Then I awoke. I also saw in my dream seven ears growing on one stalk, full and good. Seven ears, withered, thin, blighted by the east wind, sprouted after them. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears. And I told it to the magicians, 
But there was no one who could explain it to me. Verse 25. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind are also seven years of famine. It is as I told Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he's about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. But after them, there will rise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land, and the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that will follow, for it will be very severe. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that this thing is fixed by God, and God will shortly bring it about. Therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land. Take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven years plentiful. And let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt so that the land may not perish through the famine. Pray with me. Father God, we just come to you now, and Lord, as we open your awesome and perfect word, Lord, I pray that is all we will hear today. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that inspired this text, Lord, you will illuminate our eyes and our hearts to hear the word uh, that we need to hear today, Lord, not just a word to to take in, uh, but Lord, a word to live by. Father God, I pray you'll please hide this word in our hearts. I pray it be with us today and be with us for the rest of our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. For those of you who don't know, I, bef- shortly before I came to West Acres, in fact, right before I came to West Acres uh, to serve on staff, I worked at Plant Vogel. Uh, I got to wear a hard hat for, for two and a half years. And for me, uh, I had no experience in that field. Uh, they, uh, by God's grace, I was given that job. But I remember showing up, driving down River Road. I survived River Road, if you've ever been on River Road. Um, showing up uh, to the plant Vogel, the construction site. And anytime you have a, a new job like that, you're, you know, you're nervous. You don't know what to do. You don't know anybody. You're brand new. But I remember one of the first people I met at that job. His name is Will Davis. It was about that time of year. It was about this time of year, October, November, the fall. And I remember meeting him. And what was so interesting about Will was his introduction. This is, this is how he introduced himself to me. My name is Will. Uh, I've been working here for about a year. And I love the Lord. And I just, I, I was taken back by that. I, I didn't say that. I, I felt so bad. But... I was so taken back by his introduction, told me his name, how long he's been working here, and he said he loves the Lord. Uh, Will didn't know I was a Christian. Will didn't know I was preparing uh, to be in the ministry. Uh, So talk about a first impression. I went home. My wife asked me, how was your day? I said, it was really good. Uh, The guy they paired me up with uh, to train me, he's a Christian. The first thing he told me is that he loves the Lord. And I told her, I said, it's so good to work with a man of God. It's so good. And and I told Will, and I I told so many other guys that I got to know on that site, I don't know what I would do if I didn't get to work with guys like you. Uh, You're a light in this place. You're an encouragement to me. But the title of today's message is Joseph, a man of God. Joseph, a man of God. I, I believe that's one of the best compliments you can give to a person. Ladies, uh, instead of being called a man of God, you'll be called a woman of God. I believe that's one of the best compliments we can receive. I I believe when we die, that is what we should aim at being called, a godly person, a man of God, a woman of God. Why, Why do I say that? Because nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. Uh, when you come to die, it, it should be 
known how this person lived their life for God. It shouldn't be known for their possessions or, or the, the records they had or, or, or this uh, unique little factoid about them. It should be known about them that they were a person of God. Joseph, and that is what we know about him today. He was a man of God. The events surrounding his life are the definition of a tragedy. If anyone had the right to a pity party, it would be Joseph. But we see none of that. He remains headstrong. He remains obedient. He remains fruitful through every circumstance of life. How can this be? How can a man that's going through so much pain and so much suffering continue to keep his head lifted high? The answer is God. The Lord was with Joseph through everything. The Lord was with Joseph in the pit. The Lord was with Joseph uh, in Potiphar's house. The Lord was with Joseph in the jailhouse. And guess what? From today's passage, we're going to see the Lord was with Joseph in Pharaoh's house. Joseph was a man of God. And there's three things I want us to take home today from Joseph's story. There's three things I want us to learn from this man of God. Number one, trust God's timing. Trust God's timing. Now, if y'all were note takers, you're probably like, man, he sure does say that a lot. And I even, I even told my wife, I feel like I've used this point multiple times. I've only been pastor for a couple months. Uh, but she said, hey, it's in the Word. Maybe that's what we need to hear. Uh, and so uh, that's the truth. It's in His Word. Trust God's timing. Uh, two years have passed since Joseph interpreted the dreams of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. Both of their dreams came true. The cupbearer was restored to his position, serving Pharaoh again. The baker was executed. When Joseph interpreted their dreams, he asked the cupbearer, please remember me when it is well with you. He doesn't say if it is well. He says, remember me when it is well with you. Just as Joseph was confident that these dreams were true, that they were going to come true, he was confident that things would go well with him in the days ahead. However, when the chief cupbearer was released and restored back to his position, what does the Bible tell us? It says this, the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Two years pass, and Joseph is still in prison. At this point in the story, Joseph has been away for 13 years. The story began when he was 17. Uh, we read in chapter 41, he is 30 years old right now. He has spent nearly half of his life as a slave and a prisoner in a foreign land. Verse 1 says, after two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. After two whole years, uh, two full years have passed uh, since he saw the cupbearer say, see you later. Two full years, then Pharaoh has this dream. There's a few things worth mentioning. I've already said this before, but dreams in this time were very significant, especially in the land of Egypt. Egypt, they, they thought dreams were a gateway to the other realm. They thought dreams were a way to communicate with the dead. Uh, they thought dreams were a way to communicate with the gods. A second thing worth mentioning is who was having this dream? Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. He was a mere man, uh, but the people of Egypt considered Pharaoh to be a god. So if Pharaoh had a dream, it carried a lot of weight. And another thing worth mentioning is where he's at in this dream. He's in the Nile, that great river. Uh, the Nile River was central to all of life in the land of Egypt. We then get a description of Pharaoh's disturbing dreams. We see ugly skinny cows eating attractive plump cows. Uh, we, see, we also see ears of grain doing the same thing. Uh, what's interesting about these dreams is that these are things that would never happen in real life. Cows are not cannibals. And grain does not eat grain. Uh, the dreams troubled Pharaoh. The next day, Pharaoh went and got all his uh, magicians and all his wise men, but none of them could provide an interpretation. Now, what happens uh, when he, all these guys are coming up to him and saying, I don't know, sir, I don't know, your majesty, I don't know. Uh, the cupbearer light bulb goes off. Wait a minute. I know a guy. 
But he says this, I remember my offenses today. He, he remembers that he has dropped the ball when it comes to remembering Joseph. So he says, listen, I, I know this man. He, his, he was a young Hebrew. He was in prison. He interpreted the, both my dream and the baker's dream. Pharaoh responds to this information with haste. Notice the urgency in verse 14. This is how Joseph is released from prison. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. Joseph goes from being a scruffy, smelly, dirty-looking prisoner to being a clean-shaven advisor of the king of Egypt in an instant. Joseph goes from being a man that says, wait, 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 to being a man that is being hurried. Something we learn from the story of Joseph. This isn't my quote. You've probably heard it several times. God's timing is perfect. And he is never early. He is never late. He is always right on time. Joseph was not forgotten by God. God had Joseph in the perfect place for the perfect time for a specific purpose. If the cupbearer had remembered Joseph immediately after he was released two years prior... Only God knows where Joseph would be. Would he have gone home? Would he have found another a life somewhere? Would he have started a family? We don't know that. Uh, but he was in a jail cell. He was in the perfect place for Pharaoh to be able to summon this man at an instant. If, Pharaoh, uh, if Joseph had been released earlier, Pharaoh would have been left troubled without an interpretation. With a great famine coming his way. I ask this question, though, why didn't God speed up this process? Uh, why did Joseph have to wait 13 years for this to happen? Uh, why couldn't it have happened year one? Uh, why couldn't if he had just uh, been promoted in the house of Potiphar? Why, why couldn't have all of this happened then? Why did he have to go over a decade of waiting? To be honest, I, I don't know. I don't have all the answers, but I do know this. God is perfect in all His ways. He is faithful. He is good. He will never fail us. Joseph was in a season of waiting for 13 years. In that time, he served as an overseer for Potiphar. He managed the household of Potiphar. He would be thrown in prison. Uh, but God's Word tells us this. The Lord was with him. He rose to the top. He's just like that cork in water. You keep pushing him down, he rises to the top. He would become an overseer in prison. He, he would be put in charge of everything. Joseph was steadily gaining leadership and management experience through this season of waiting. Uh, think about this. His resume was gradually being developed in this season of waiting. Manager, administrator, leader. Chuck Swindoll says this, All whom God uses greatly are first hidden in the secret of his presence, away from the pride of man. It is there our vision clears. It is there the silt drops from the current of our life, and our faith begins to grasp his arm. Abraham waited for the birth of Isaac. Moses, Moses didn't lead the exodus until he was 80. Elijah waited beside the brook. Think about this. This blows me away. Noah waited 120 years for rain. Have you waited that long for something? Paul was hidden away for three years in Arabia. The list goes on and on. God is working while his people are waiting, waiting, waiting. In my own life, I've had those seasons of waiting. and I, I know you two, uh, you have also. I thought about uh, things I've waited for in this life. I had to wait for a spouse. I had to wait for a wife. Um, I met her, and, but she made me wait to marry her. And, and I had to propose three times. Three times. I had to wait five years. And I'll be honest with you, it was frustrating. I said, what, what's your deal? <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to marry me? I mean, I had the ring like in the middle of that time. Still had to wait. But I tell you right now, I am so glad I waited. And God gave me the best wife in the world. Waiting is a good thing. Waiting is a good thing, young people. Waiting is a good thing. Uh, something else I had to wait for uh, 
was the opportunity to serve in a church. I've shared this with you before. Uh, God called me into the ministry at the age of 21. And it was during that time that, uh, you know, I'd heard so many stories. I, I thought, God, you're, you're just going to put me in a church somewhere. You're going to put me in a little, little white church out in the country. And I'm going to be able to pastor this place while, while I go to school and study. And the reason I thought that is because I'd seen so many other men go through that path. And while I was in college, I, I had friends, I had peers. Uh, the, while they were doing their studies, they were also pastoring at the same time. And that's something I wholeheartedly wanted I desired that. I I even sought that out. I I went on countless interviews. Those will be uh, sermon illustrations for years to come um, because some of them are really bad. Um, But God closed the door every single time. I I didn't serve on a church staff until I was 31 years old, and that's when West Acres Baptist Church graciously gave me the opportunity to serve here. I worked uh, various jobs along the way I was not passionate about. You ever worked in a job you're not passionate about? With that said, those 10 years of waiting were tough. Uh, They were stressful. During that time, I knew the Lord had called me into ministry. uh, But I don't know how many conversations I had with Kristen. I just don't know if this was supposed to, if this is it. I don't know. Why hasn't happened yet? I had so many frustrations, so many doubts. But I look back now at those 10 years, I'm on the other side, and I am so thankful for those 10 years. I'm so thankful for all those seasons, all those uh, jobs I worked at that I probably complained about. God was using my time there to mold me and to make me and to develop me into the man that stands here today. And, And I would have never imagined serving in the CSRA I thought the Lord would call me to another state somewhere. I would have never imagined following in the steps of someone I I hold in very high regard. So God is good. Let me tell you this. Waiting is hard, but waiting is so good. Waiting is so good. Are you in a season of waiting? Are you in a season of pain and suffering? Are you in a season of doubt? Are you in a season that you could characterize like like Joseph, that you would say, I am in a pit. How long do I have to wait here? I want to encourage you, church. I want you to take heart and know that this time is not in vain. Stay close to God and trust in His perfect timing. That door, that window, that opportunity... Uh, Whatever he's waiting for you on is going to come. The second thing we learn from Joseph, this man of God, is this. Number two, don't forget God. Don't forget God. I I love that. We read throughout the the scriptures, how long, O Lord? How long? But I feel like he's telling us that every day. How long, Malone? How long, so-and-so? He's waiting on us. In the next section, uh, Pharaoh shares his dreams with Joseph. Joseph then interprets the dream. In short, Joseph shares that these dreams represent seven years of plenty that are going to be followed by seven years of famine. Remember, Joseph has just been taken out of a pit. Um, He has just been a prisoner. He had a beard. Uh, He probably looked like the Unabomber. Uh, I mean, he, uh, at this time, Egypt as a nation, was a world superpower. He has been taken from the pit and brought into the presence of the king of Egypt. Uh, A comparison for us to think about, this would be like being taken into the White House, into the Oval Office. I've never been to the White House, but I would just be amazed to stand out front of it. But to be in the Oval Office? I ask myself this question, how did this affect Joseph? Was he nervous? Was he scared? Was he sweating bullets? Did he compromise? We don't read that in the text. Instead, we see Joseph as a man that constantly points to God. When he's first questioned about interpreting dreams, the Bible says this in verse 16. Joseph answered, Pharaoh, it's not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Notice this. He doesn't just say God's going to give you an answer. God's going to give you a favorable answer. But look in in your text. Joseph hasn't even heard the dream yet. He doesn't even know yet. 
He says, God's going to give you a favorable answer. Uh, Joseph quickly points to God as being the source for his interpretation. This shows us Joseph's humility, but it also shows us his utter devotion, his utter dependence on God, the one who has been with him these past 13 years. Church, Christian, we are nothing without God. Uh, If you're trying to live this Christian life in your own power, good luck. It's not going to happen. We are nothing without Him. We, we cannot do this thing called the Christian life in our own power. The power is in Jesus Christ. John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus is saying this, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. We can't do anything without Jesus. And we see that it was the case for Joseph as well. Notice how many times Joseph refers to God in this passage. Verse 25, then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he's about to do. Verse 28, it is as I told Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he's about to do. Verse 32, and the doubling of Pharaoh's dreams means that the thing is fixed by God and God will shortly bring it about. God, God, God. Joseph repeatedly mentions God. And who is he in the presence of? He's in the presence of someone that the country considers a God. He is not intimidated by the king of Egypt. He knows who the king of this world is. That is God. Here's a good quote for you. God didn't forget Joseph. Joseph didn't forget God. This was a man of God through and through. Uh, God was on the the throne of his life in the pit. God was on the throne of his life in the palace. Uh, Joseph was all about God. It it amazes me, though, that so many times when we are on the mountaintop, we forget about God. So many times when we are living in those times of prosperity, the times that are considered good, we forget about God. Our, Our spiritual life diminishes. We don't spend time in His Word. We don't spend time in prayer. We don't talk about Him. Uh, It it just amazes me. So I I feel like this is such a good warning for the church. When things are going well, don't forget God. When your bank account is in good shape, don't forget God. Uh, When the stock market is doing well, don't forget God. God. When the job is great, don't forget God. When your belly is full, don't forget God. You might need to lose some weight. Let me warn you. Don't forget God. He's God of the valley. He is God of the mountain. Finally, the third thing we learn about Joseph, this man of God, is this. Number three, take action on God's word. Immediately after sharing the interpretation, Joseph gives counsel uh, to Pharaoh regarding his dreams. Egypt is about to experience seven years of plenty that are going to be followed by seven years of famine. In fact, the famine is going to be uh, so horrible, they're going to forget about these seven years of plenty. Joseph tells Pharaoh this in verse 33, set a discerning and wise man over the land. He then tells him that Egypt should collect 20% of the land's produce for the next seven years and save it as reserves for the seven years of famine that lie ahead. I love this passage for a few reasons. First, it shows us Joseph's leadership ability. Uh, Joseph not only points out a problem, but he gives a solution. Too many times we got people that can point a problem out a mile away, but they have nothing to say in regards to a solution. Great leaders like Joseph are great problem solvers. They they take initiative, they're proactive in addressing problems when they arise. Joseph didn't hesitate, he didn't say, Pharaoh, let's get a committee together. He didn't do any of that. He says, hey man, this is what you gotta do. This is what you gotta do. Secondly, uh, this passage teaches us a godly lesson on stewardship. Stewardship, that's a cuss word in the church, right? Managing our assets and finances. When God blesses us with plenty, we don't need to spend, spend, spend. I I know a lot of us are just like, man, what are they doing in Washington right now? They're doing the same thing you do each and every week. They're living outside of their means. We need to save 
and invest in our future. And for the Christian that saves and invests in the future, what are you investing in with the future? You are investing in the kingdom of God. And the last time I checked, that lasts forever. That lasts forever. We're always talking about, man, why'd you pay so much money for that? It lasts a long time. That's why I want to invest in it. I tell you, I know something that's going to last forever and ever and ever. That's why we invest in it. In life, we will have times of plenty, but we're also going to have times when we are lacking. We see godly wisdom in this plan that Joseph has presented to Pharaoh. Uh, Church family, let me just say this. A lot of times, the, the primary reason people don't give to the Lord is not because they don't have anything. It's because they don't know how to manage what they have. They are poor stewards with the riches God has entrusted in them. In Luke chapter 16, verse 10, uh, we get a beautiful phrase for this. It says, one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. One who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in very much. This was the story of Joseph. He was faithful with the little things. This is why God entrusted him with much. And we can learn from that principle. Such a great word of wisdom on stewardship. Thirdly and most importantly, Joseph takes action. Uh, He receives a word from the Lord. Guess what? He takes action on it. Uh, Too many times uh, we receive a word from the Lord, yet we do nothing with it. Uh, Too many times we'll we'll spend an hour in God's word with a devotional or with this Bible study or that Bible study. We'll take it in, but we don't do anything with it. Uh, Too many times we want to go to a church that has a preacher like the Apostle Paul and we'll get a sermon there, yet we don't do anything with it. We take a word from God, but we don't do anything with it. Joseph took action after he received this word. God's word requires action. Uh, For Joseph, God's word revealed that a famine was coming in the days ahead. He told Pharaoh, uh, this is what God is going to do. This thing is fixed. And guess what? It's fixed. It's going to happen. It's also going to happen quickly. It's coming shortly. What did Joseph do? He made a plan of action. For us today, we guess what? Uh, we don't have the dreams of Pharaoh. We don't have to count on an interpretation, a dream interpretation. We have it in black and white. In 66 books that's composed of a thing called the Bible. We know what God has done. The scriptures just show us everything that has happened in redemptive history's past, but this book has a lot to say about what is going to happen in the days ahead. So I ask these questions, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? With the question of what has God done, uh, we can look throughout the Old Testament, the New Testament, we can see all the wonderful things God has done, but this is the most wonderful thing God has done. He has given us His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for us. Uh, We sang of that song, the old rugged cross. He died on an old rugged cross for us to provide a way for salvation. That's the word. That's the good news. But what are we supposed to do with it? If you don't know, this is what you're supposed to do with it. You're supposed to repent of your sins. Uh, You're supposed to recognize, I am a sinner doomed for hell. And I recognize that Jesus is my only way to the Father. Jesus Christ is my only means of salvation. So your plan of action is asking Jesus to save you from your sins. So are you going to be like a Joseph or are you going to take action? Are you just going to keep receiving that day after day after day and saying no? The second thing we can ask is this, what is God going to do? Uh, God's word reveals this, Jesus Christ is coming back. If Joseph was in the room today, he would say, man, I don't need a a dream interpretation. It says it right here, countless times. He's coming back. Guess what? This thing is fixed. It's going to happen. And guess what? It's going to happen quickly. It's going to happen quickly. So what is the plan of action? What is the plan of action for that? It's the same thing I just told you. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you repent of your sins, you call out to Him, you say, Lord Jesus, save me. 
You, you believe in him as your only means of salvation. Because guess what? He is the only way. And this is another part of that plan of action. If you're in the camp that says, man, I've got Jesus, I am saved, this is the other plan of action. There is urgency with this. The clock is ticking. It is fixed. God knows the day where he's going to say, go gather my people. He's going to come back. So I, I want to say this. Are, is there any urgency in your feet when it comes to sharing the gospel with other people? Is there any urgency in sharing the gospel with your mom and your dad that you know that doesn't know Jesus? Is there any urgency in knowing your child doesn't know Jesus? Is there any urgency knowing my brother, my sister, the one I grew up with, we shared a bunk bed? Is there any urgency in sharing Jesus with that person? Or do we just come day after day, Sunday after Sunday, season after season, take it in, go to lunch, repeat, forget it? What are you going to do with it? Be a man of action. Be a woman of action. We have received God's word. It is a fixed thing. And it's going to happen quickly. Jesus says, it's going to be like a thief in the night. Last time I checked, you don't plan for a thief in the night. You wake up and you say, whoa. You don't know. They don't put that on your calendar. Two truths we must remember. These are two truths. The death rate is 100%. Billy Graham said it that everybody's going to die. Everybody's going to die. Unless we're still here when Jesus comes back. Those are two truths. We're either going to die or we're going to be here when Jesus comes back. With that said, eternity is at stake. Are you prepared for eternity? Egypt had to get ready for the coming famine. Are you ready for the coming, Lord? Are you just going to take it in? Or are you going to do something about it? Are you prepared for what's next? In closing, Joseph was a man of God. We learned several things about Joseph through this series, but there's three things specifically today. Number one, trust God's timing. Remember, waiting is hard, but waiting is a good thing. I, I, love, I, I love chili this time of year. You know what I absolutely hate? Instant chili. It's disgusting. I like cooking it in a crock pot. That chili that, that takes some time, I've heard somebody say this, it's righteous. It's righteous. Waiting is a good thing. Number two, don't forget God. Don't be the person that just has God in the pit. Be the person that has God in the palace. Don't forget God. Number three, this is most important, take action on God's word. If you've received God's word today, guess what? You're guilty if you don't take action. The clock is ticking. I shared this story yesterday at Miss Hilda's funeral. This was in one of my devotionals this week. It comes from a pastor named Stephen Kyle in Panama City. I read the My Daily Devotional. It's, it's uh, written by several uh, other prominent Southern Baptist pastors. He says this, Once while we were going door to door to share our faith, a man told us, I'm just not ready to give my life to Jesus because I love my life. In his mind, if Jesus comes into your life, your life is just miserable. That was his worldview. The pastor said, I appreciate his honesty, but his bold comment shocked me. My friend took it in stride and replied with these words, but until you have Jesus, you don't even have life. Until you have Jesus, until you know Jesus, you don't even know life. The man said, no thanks. And he closed the door. We, quiet, we quietly prayed on his porch before we left. God, may your spirit reveal to this man what real life is. A couple of weeks later, they were in a church service. Who did they see going down to speak to the pastor at the end of the service? This man. The pastor later said, his exact words were this. Pastor, I want real life. 
And I've been told Jesus can give it to me. The Bible says, he who does not believe the Son shall not see life. This is a powerful reminder that many who seem to be alive today are dead in their sins. Abundant life, eternal life, real life are only found in Jesus. Amen. So church, that is the word today that you have received. And I ask this question, what are you going to do about it? Will you stand with me? moment we're, we're going to have a time that you can respond take action right take action and this is a time to take action uh, this is a time where I don't know what the Lord has communicated to your heart I know we've covered a lot of ground today there's no one size fits all but I want I do want to just let you know this altar is open for prayer a lot of times for us to take action we need to pray over it right you can pray here you can pray in your seat but I do want to say this, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if you know that today that you died, or if the Lord came back, that you're not ready, I want to tell you this, you can be ready today. You, you can do it in your seat. All you have to do is just recognize, I am a sinner, I am nothing without Jesus, and I want Him to come into my life. You can do that right there. There's no magic prayer. Uh, there's no 12-step program. It's a one-step program. You turn from sin, you turn to Jesus. But I do want to let you know this. I'd love to talk to you some more about that. This decision has eternity at stake. And we have some counselors here. We'll have pastors at the altar that would love to talk to you more about that. Love to rejoice in that decision with you. And one of the things that we, we hold to in this church is that once you come to know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you let the world know about it. And we'd love to encourage you to be baptized. So if that's you today, I just want to give you this opportunity to respond. Let me pray for you.